Peter, welcome and thank you so much for joining us and your willingness to be our first person today. We have so much for you to cover in a short period, so we'll, we'll start right away if that's okay with you. But thanks I have no here. choice. <laughs> you have no choice, okay. <laughs> Peter, World War II of course began when Germany and Russia invaded Poland in September 1939. Before we turn to the war and to the, to the Holocaust, start first by telling us about your family and you in the years before the war. Well, just a little bit of history of Jewish people in Hungary. They have been uh, living in Central Europe uh, for more than 2,000 years. Actually, the Hungarian tribes arrived about 800 years later before Jews, uh, as part of the Roman Empire, settled in what is Hungary today. Unfortunately, anti-Semitism and the history of anti-Semitism is as long as the Hungarian Jewish presence in Hungary. Without going into details, uh, there was a golden age of uh, Hungarian Jews uh, in the late 19th century when Jews were emancipated, they got equal rights with every citizens. Actually, they became citizens. They uh, were awarded all kinds of aristocratic titles. They were leaders of the industries. And unfortunately, this one ended with the First World War. Hungary, unfortunately, as usual, they were on the losing side of uh, the war, and after the war was over, they, um, as usual again, blamed the Jews. As far as my family is concerned, they have been living what was that time the Austrian-Hungarian Empire. At various uh, parts of the empire, my mom was actually born what is now Ukraine. At that time, it was part of Hungary. Some of her siblings were born uh, what is Slovakia today and the Czech Republic. And um, on my mom's side, I came from a very orthodox observant family. My great-grandfather was a rabbi in a small town. My mom had a very religious upbringing and very religious observant uh, lifestyle. On my father's side, uh, the family came or became a member of the Jewish community, which is approximately the same as the conservative Judaism here in the United States. They met in the early 30s, uh, got married in 1937, and um, the rest is history. How large of an extended family did you have? My mom had uh, nine siblings, mm -hmm. and uh, my father had uh, two brothers. Uh, unfortunately, on my father's side, I practically never get to know anybody because my father, his two brothers, died uh, during the Holocaust. My grandparents, my father's uh, parents, they died during the Holocaust, not because they were killed or sent to concentration camps, but because they were old and, and weak and there was no food, there was no medical supply. So they died naturally, I mean, natural causes, but definitely it was the consequence of the war and the Holocaust. Tell us, some, tell us about your mother's business. My mother was a milliner, a female hat maker, which was a very good business that time in the 1930s, 40s, uh, hats were very popular and she made beautiful hats. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had a good middle class living, a nice apartment in the middle of the city, which was the best part of the city that time. And um, my father was um, a clerk at a publishing company. Uh, he, 
one could could be a lawyer. Um, Fortunately, and that's again part of the history of uh, anti-Semitism in Hungary, that the first anti-Semitic laws in Europe wasn't in Nazi Germany, but it was in Hungary in 1920. The Hungarian government uh, made a law by Latin name numerus clausus, which restricted the number of Jewish students in uh, universities and uh, higher education institutions. My father wanted to be a lawyer. She ap- he applied uh, three times. He was rejected three times for one reason and one reason only because he was Jewish. So at some point then he ended up pretty much joining your mother in her business. Correct. Uh, again, as the persecution of the Jews got uh, worse and worse in Hungary, first Jews were um, banned from government jobs. Later on, they were banned from any managerial job at any company. Mm-hmm. My father saw that uh, the best way to make sure that our family would make a living to join my mom and he learned the female hat making business also and before he was conscripted to the forced labor battalion he worked with That's my what mom. He's doing. The, although World War II began in September 1939, the full brunt of it didn't hit Hungary until 1944 but as you were beginning to tell us, nonetheless, conditions worsened for Jews in 1939 and increasingly got worse for your family, and then especially when your father was taken for forced labor. Tell us uh, what your circumstances were like when the war began, and then what it meant once your father was conscripted into the labor battalion. The Holocaust history in Hungary is a little bit different from the rest of Europe because, as you mentioned, Hungary wasn't occupied by Nazi Germany until 1944. Nevertheless, Jewish life was very, very, very bad uh, for various uh, reasons. Number one, year after year, Stricter and stricter anti-Jewish laws were enacted by the Hungarian government. First, they were kicked out from government jobs. Later on, they, as I mentioned, right. any kind of manage, managerial jobs. Their numbers were restricted in professions like doctors and uh, lawyers. So only 12% of the doctors could practice, uh, Jewish doctors could uh, practice, and (coughs) Jewish doctors could see only Jewish patients, and Jewish patients could uh, go only to Jewish doctors. Later on, uh, mixed marriages uh, were banned also. Uh, Intimate relationship between Jews and non-Jews were prohibited uh, by law, and uh, non-Jewish person could not serve uh, in Jewish households or uh, work for uh, Jewish employers. We were the victims, and actually not we were the victims, the very young uh, lady my mom hired as a nanny. She was a Christian girl from the countryside, and she came to Budapest to take care of me for a good salary. But when the law was enacted, uh, my mom had to let her go. She lost her job. My mom lost uh, her helper. It wasn't good for anybody. And then, of course, in October 40, 1940, your father was taken for the forced labor battalion, and and she was pregnant. Correct. Uh, My mom was, I think, three months pregnant uh, with me when my father was taken to the forced labor battalion. These were very, very specific to Hungary during this time. Jewish males between the age 18 and 55 were conscripted to the army, but because they didn't trust them with weapons, with rifles or handguns, they served as slave laborers attached to military units. 
So when the war started and the military units started to move from one place to another, so did the people in the forced labor camp. And you saw the, the picture. They uh, had a regular military uniform, but they didn't get the winter uniform, for example, which was essential for survival when in 1942 the Hungarian army with uh, the Nazi German army invaded uh, the Soviet Union. The German army went first in 1941 mm -hmm. and the Hungarians in 1942 and so did my father at that time. And as, apart from the inadequate um, uh, uniforms and the weather, the working conditions for them were exceptionally brutal and harsh. Correct. Uh, they uh, did all the dirty job for the army, repairing uh, roads and uh, building bridges. But not only that, uh, once they were in Ukraine, they were used for defusing the mines the retreating Soviet Red Army left behind minefields in order to slow down the progress of the Nazi and uh, German and Hungarian army. And the Hungarian troops used the Jewish uh, slave laborers to defuse these mines. Now these people weren't trained for do doing this. They were teachers, lawyers, clerks, whatnot. The way they fused the mines was that the people in the forced labor battalion had to march in front of the regular Hungarian army. Into the minefield. Into the minefield. And as the minefield exploded, so did the people who um, walked through the field. When, you're, when your father left, did your mother know where he had gone? Yes and no. While my father was away at the forced labor camp, he was able to send postcards from the camp. Now, because this forced labor battalion was attached to military units, uh, they, uh, he, she had to, oh, he had to put a uh, post office number mm -hmm. and uh, it was a military post office number. So the actual location, um, my mom wasn't aware, but because in the news, they knew that the Hungarian army moved into Ukraine and that time the Hungarian army was approximately 200, 250,000 people plus 100,000 Hungarian forced laborer, the Jews who were in these uh, labor battalions. And out of the 100,000, 40,000 never came back. They never came back because they died during war activities. They died because of the harsh circumstances. Russian or Ukrainian winters are uh, very harsh and uh, the winter of Winter of 1942-1943 was extremely severe. The snow was 30-40 centimeters high, knee high or, or up to the waist. And under those circumstances, uh, with the inadequate clothes they had, these people had to march. They didn't have enough food. They were weak, so if they sat down, in five minutes, uh, they froze to death. Your, your father, at some point, was able to come home, and that's the photograph that we saw earlier. What, what do you know about uh, that from your mom, about his being able to come home for that short period? Well, it was a long weekend. Uh, he was uh, released uh, because I was born and uh, they had mercy on him and let him go for a long weekend. I can only m imagine, my mom never told me what they uh, did or discussed during those uh, three days, but uh, 
the picture you saw was made by a professional photographer, and there are some amateur pictures taken by my mom and uh, my father. I'm sitting on uh, his um, arm, stark naked. This is why we didn't show it. <laughs> <laughs> and. Um, but again, you can imagine, my father was already away for seven or eight months, and um, uh, they tried to catch up uh, with you, what... You, sh you shared with me, Peter, that you have a glimpse, really, of your mother's life, what it was like for her with your father gone. Tell us what you can about that time with your father gone and your mother's... Um, caring for an infant and then learning about your father's death? I'm a child survivor. I was only four years old when uh, my mom and I was liberated in the Budapest ghetto. So my personal memories of uh, the Holocaust are very sparse. And um, what I know about what happened to us, what happened to my father, I know because my mom preserved the postcards my father sent until the last one sent before Christmas 1942. And also my mom started um, jotting down everything what was happening to us, uh, to me. Her hope was that one day I'm gonna, uh, or we are going to be reunited uh, with my father, and so she could refresh her memory, what my first uh, words were, uh, what food I like, what I didn't like. So she had a notebook, which wasn't an actual diary. It was her business notebook. She wrote down the names of her customers and their phone numbers and uh, the size of their uh, had and what kind of hat they ordered. And between two customers, she wrote on a couple of things, uh, which later became a regular diary when she got a notification that my father disappeared during the war activities. She turned this one to a regular diary. And I have um, three... Uh, notebooks like uh, this one, that's what my mom used. She wrote, unfortunately, with um, pencil, and they are faded, so I, have a, I had a hard time translating it. But, and also, I think I have a copy of the postcard, not the copy, the original postcard uh, my father sent. Um, ultimately, both the cards and the notebook will end up in the collection of the museum. And the museum has a very extensive collection of Holocaust diaries. But just to give you a glimpse of how people felt during uh, those times, uh, here is uh, some sentences from my father's last postcard. Please write exhaustive letters, and if you can, please send lots of pictures of yourself and little Peter. I gaze on the pictures I have, and they give me strength to struggle. The work is very hard, but I'm getting stronger, and thanks God, I can endure in good health. From my mom's diary, I can follow the emotional roller coaster she went through as uh, she tried to deal with work, with family, and uh, the absence of my father. So from the emotional high of love, she went to the emotional low of depression. And here are some illustrations about her love. You have no idea how much I long to see you. The thought of seeing you and having you next to me drives me insanity. Why the good Lord punishes me so much that the one I adore the most is separated from me for such a long time? About her desperation. I cannot stand this horrible situation 
and I'm heading to a nervous breakdown. I try to control myself and I try to believe that you are not in any trouble. You have just haven't had an opportunity to write. And um, she wrote about uh, mundane things, about her guilt. She was a Jewish mother, so guilt came naturally. <laughs> Last night I was a coffee house with my uh, friends. Um, you were in my mind. Who knows, you might be starving. You are cold, you wear rags while I'm here at the coffee house. I have such a remorse, although I know that you are not mad at me. And of course, there were some information about me, the food I liked, the strange way I pronounced uh, unpronounceable Hungarian words, and also uh, how much I didn't like to go to the pool. Thank, thank you for sharing that, Peter, very much. When did your mother learn about your father's death? The first notification came from the Hungarian Ministry of Defense in January 17, if I remember correctly. It's a pre-printed form, my father's name and the date and the place of his disappearance, uh, notifying my mother that my father disappeared during war activities. Now this could have meant anything because uh, some of the people died and um, the Hungarian army just couldn't retrieve the, bo retrieve the bodies. So they disappeared. Some of them were captured by the Soviet Red Army and they were sent to camps in Siberia. So they disappeared from the Hungarian army. And um, again, some of them died because of starvation or frozen to death or uh, being blown up uh, on the mine fields. So my mom still had the hope that uh, my father would return and then another notification came uh, two months later declaring uh, my father dead. That was important legally for the army to uh, give account what happened to one person. So my father was officially declared dead, although we didn't know. And again, 60,000 Hungarian Jews uh, survived and some of them came back uh, to Hungary after the war, but unfortunately my father wasn't among them. So once she had that notice, um, there she is continuing to try to make ends meet, keep her little business going and to uh, take care of you. And then of course things became profoundly worse in March 1944 when the Nazis, when the Germans occupied Hungary. Tell us why they came in in March 1944 and what changed so dramatically at that point. Until March 1944, we lived in our apartment. My mother continued uh, her uh, business, making hats. And uh, we bought whatever was available. By that time, food was rationed, so uh, you could buy just certain amount of bread and sugar and flour, whatnot. But uh, we were still alive. We were still living in our apartment. March 90, uh, 1994 changed everything for the Jewish people. Nazi Wehrmacht, the Nazi army, was retreating from the Soviet Union. Uh, the war was winding down. The Nazis knew that sooner or later it's going to end. And they did not trust the Hungarian government anymore, that the uh, Hungarian go government were the last allies of Nazi Germany, practically, because all the other countries, Italy and Romania, jumped to the other side at the first possible opportunity. So Nazi Germany finally occupied Hungary also. Adolf Eichmann, the infamous Adolf Eichmann, arrived to Budapest with uh, 
600 uh, SS uh, officer with the purpose to execute the final solution in Hungary also. The Jewish population in Hungary, including the reoccupied territories which first were taken away from Hungary after the First World War, but at the beginning of Second World War, Hungary reoccupied them. This is why actually they joined Nazi Germany. There were about 800,000 Hungarian Jews uh, still living in 1944. The deportation of the Hungarian Jews started immediately in April 1944. In three months, uh, more than 400,000 Hungarian Jews, mostly from the countryside, were taken to various uh, concentration camps mostly Auschwitz, uh, Birkenau, but other places also, Belzec and other places. The Jews in Budapest were relatively safe because this was a tremendous logistical problem for the Nazis to deport and exterminate 800 Jews in 800, such a- 800,000. 800,000 Jews in such a short period of time. So the Jews who lived in Budapest were relatively safe. However, our circumstances changed completely. By the decree of the Hungarian government, we had to leave our uh, apartment and move into so-called designated houses. The houses were marked just as the Jewish people with the yellow star of David and uh, non-Jews had to move out from those apartment buildings and Jews uh, moved in. Sometimes four or five families in a one or two bedroom apartment. We were supposed to do this also, however, my mom was determined to survive whatever it takes. And we were lucky that she had a childhood friend, a non-Jew, a Catholic, couple, they didn't have children, they lived in a two-bedroom apartment, and they let us move in. And it was a big thing, not just for us, because we were safe for another few weeks, but it was a big thing for them, because the same decree which said that the Hungarian Jews had to move to this to these um, designated houses said also that those Jews who go into hiding will be arrested, persecuted immediately, and so would the uh, families who would uh, hide them. And there were a few, unfortunately, very few non-Jews who risked their very own life to save uh, Jews among uh, them. And this mother. couple did that. But you, were, you and your mother were quickly denounced by a neighbor, I believe. Yeah, that's unfortunately a very um, sad part of the this, uh, Hungarian um, Holocaust history, that there were uh, non-Jews who collaborated with the Nazis, and there were bystanders. Bystanders who saw that Jews were arrested and did absolutely nothing. They saw that Jews were deported and did absolutely nothing. And many of them uh, went so far that uh, they reported hiding Jews. And so uh, after three weeks, uh, we were reported by a good neighbor. And next day, two Hungarian uh, policemen, actually gendarme, which is an um, Actually, police unit in Hungary came and arrested my mother. And this is one of your few early memories. Is you actually have some recollection of this? Uh, yes, that's correct. Uh, probably the reason for this because these um, Hungarian gendarmes had a very uh, fancy uniform. They had a tall uh, hat and there were cock feather mm -hmm. attached to it, and um, they looked for a three-year-old 
boy, very fascinating. Uh, we were sitting around the breakfast table. I was sitting on two uh, thick uh, phone books. You younger people, you don't know what phone books are. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, they, um, they, we didn't have child seats, so this is how I reached the table. And uh, they took my mom away. And uh, my mom and the host couple uh, said, um, don't worry, Peter, uh, she's going to be back in a couple of days. And I wouldn't say that it was a lie, but um, unfortunately, they knew that the likelihood that my mother would come back was very small. And incredibly, she did, after that arrest, she was able to, to get away. And that's an incredible story. It is, and it's part of why I'm here today. It's, it's part of my mom's determination to survive. Uh, when she was taken, uh, when, in one of the worst Hungarian jail in Budapest, uh, she had with her that notification she got from the Hungarian Ministry of Defense that my father uh, died during war activities. As soon as she got to the jail, she claimed to the warden that she was a war widow. War widows were a special designation by the Hungarian government, those widows of regular soldiers, not the Hungarian Jews who were serving in the forced labor battalion, who were, anyway, um, those were declared war widows. They had some kind of privileges. When food was rationed, they got more mm -hmm. food and they got some uh, money from the Hungarian government. Anyway, my mom claimed that she was a war widow, which she wasn't because she didn't get uh, any privileges. Nevertheless, the warden, who probably couldn't even read what was on the paper, she saw an official form, my father's name on it, and a big stamp on it. So he got scared, and that was my mom telling me later on, much later on, actually, but that's another story that uh, she was taken to the commandant of the jail. Uh, the commandant uh, looked at the paper. My mom couldn't tell me whether she knew that uh, the commandant saw that she was not a war widow and the commandant had a pity on her or she was ignorant or he was ignorant also, just like the warden anyway. They let her go. She came back two days later. I had, we had to move again because we just couldn't wait for another good right. neighbor report. And, and since you had to move again, she then made another major decision uh, to, to, as to how she was going to protect you. Correct. Uh, again, we still did not move into any of the designated houses because my mom knew, she just knew and knew that once the Jews were gathered at one place, it would be very easy to take to another place, another place. And by that time, there were rumors of, of uh, deportations and people uh, were taken to the death camps. So instead of moving to these designated houses or the Budapest ghetto, which was already set up at Which is where I think time, your grandparents were. Correct, yeah. and okay. my two uh, aunts also. We moved to a house uh, which was um, set up by the Swedish embassy and by Rolf Wallenberg, who came to Hungary in early 1944, the American War Refugee Board, which was set up by President Roosevelt in uh, late 1943, early 1944. They sent uh, people in diplomatic disguise to various European cities to save as many Jews as possible. The Swedish aristocrat, Rolf Wallenberg, who was not Jewish, who had no connection to Hungary whatsoever, came to Hungary, 
with a, a lot of money um, given him by the War Refugee Board. What he did with the money, number one, he did uh, create some false documents and gave false documents to Hungarian Jews so they could be protected. Mm -hmm. Not many were, unfortunately. Also, he bought up 32 apartment buildings in Budapest, and because these buildings belonged to the Swedish embassy, under international diplomatic laws, they were regarded as territory of that country, and no Hungarian authorities could enter, no Nazis uh, could enter into this building without Swedish permission. So the Jews who were lucky enough to get into these protected houses, 32 high rises, eight to 10 stories high in the inner city of Budapest, housed tens of thousands of Hungarian Jews. And these Jews can thank the the US government and the Swedish diplomat who paid with his very own life with uh, his heroic uh, deeds. Hungarian Jews uh, survived because uh, for three months we lived in these protected houses. And Every day meant uh, just more chance to survive. I, I, I might um, just jump ahead for just a minute because of time, but. Of course, during that whole period, your, um, Budapest is under intense Allied bombing that's going on at that time. Um, there was so much pressure on the Hungarian government that the deportation stopped for a period um, after 450,000 were deported in six, six or eight weeks. Then they stopped for a period, and you're in the Raoul Wallenberg house, but then there was, a, if I understand it right, there was a coup, the, the, fa the Hungarian fascists took control of the country, the Arrow Cross. Correct. And so now it's October 1944, you're, you're in the Wallenberg House, things are changing again. Things are changing again for the worse for uh, us Jews. Um, we had to move again because uh, these Nazi, Hungarian Nazi thugs, uh, young people who weren't uh, conscripted in the Hungarian army because they were too young, but they were uh, part of the nationalist uh, Nazi Hungarian party. The Arrow Cross. The Arrow Cross. Uh, they came into the Wallenberg causes and started to arrest uh, people. Some of the people were taken to the railway station and deported to the camps uh, straight. Others were uh, taken um, to the banks of the Danube River, River. They were lined up. They had to strip their clothes and um, they were shot into the river. We escaped uh, because, uh, I don't know you if know, we have You have time, time to tell uh, this, yes. Yeah. Uh, again, when I make this talk about our, our Holocaust story, I use the word, we were lucky, we had a chance uh, too many times. Uh, regardless of your religious belief, it could be a, a divine intervention. It can be a sheer chance why one person survived and other didn't. In our case, we survived because I, made a Nazi friend. I made a Nazi friend uh, between two bombing raids. We were uh, playing in the inner court of the apartment building where we stayed, and this Nazi, ta Nazi people who surrounded the building, they were protecting us, protecting us, so, sure. They um, were there and they saw us playing there, uh, cowboys and Indians, and we used whatever we had to imitate rifles, and we were shooting at each other. And uh, it was very funny for these uh, young Nazi guys 
seeing Jewish uh, children with a yellow star or they with uh, shooting at each other. And sometimes they fortunately took out the ammo from the, their rifle, but they gave us the rear rifle. And uh, that was uh, the top of my joy. I mean, uh, you young with <laughs> boys with a rear rifle. I didn't know what it was, but uh, Nevertheless, anyway, so one of these guys uh, knew me by first name. So when they came to the apartment, to our apartment, and led the people away, he told to his friends that, um, let's leave little Peter and her mom behind, I know them. And they went to the next apartment, and they were not that lucky. And as soon as they left, we left also. Finally, we moved to the Budapest ghetto, which was set up in the middle of Bud Budapest, where my grandparents had their one-bedroom apartment. They lived there, and my two aunts lived there with my cousin already, and my mom and I moved uh, to this uh, house. And when you moved into the, the ghetto, in the Budapest ghetto, the Russians began their siege of Budapest at that time. So you are there right in the middle of the siege. Tell, tell, us, tell us about that time. Yes, uh, I, um, obviously uh, you cannot forget the sounds of the cannons and the bombings and the airplane zooming over your head. We spent uh, most of our time in the basement of the building, which was a temporary bomb shelter. Dirt floor, uh, no electricity, no water, no food. And we were just sitting on a blanket on the dirt floor and that's how we spent most of the days because during the die night there were no uh, bombing. And uh, food, I don't know up until today how, he survived, how we survived, but I do remember one thing because it was such, so out of the ordinary. Between two beam, bombing raids, our parents, grandparents went out and they went to the bombed out houses and they rummaged through the, the rubbles to find anything edible, whether it was stale or uh, rotten, it really didn't matter because every calorie would give you another day, another chance to survive. And one day my grandmother, who was a very orthodox uh, observant Jew, Jewess, came uh, back to our building uh, with a big slab of bacon. Now, probably you know that uh, Bacon is not kosher and it's absolutely no, no. But this time you just couldn't keep the religious laws. You ate whatever uh, you could because again, every- There's no food. Is yeah. the, um, you'd mentioned the winter of 42, 43 is a very harsh one. So was the winter of 44, 45, particularly brutal. So you have no electricity, you have no heat. Um, it was a terrible circumstances and then then literally hand-to-hand -hand combat began in, all around you. What, what do you remember? What can you tell us about your liberation? I don't know the date, but uh, from history books, I know that the Budapest ghetto was uh, liberated in uh, January 19, 1845. What I do remember, uh, Russian, um, or sorry, that time Soviet Red Army soldiers uh, came into the ghetto and um, they gave uh, the grown-up cigarettes and uh, us uh, little children uh, candies. That time I didn't know I shouldn't take candy from people I didn't know. <laughs> and, uh, and that was the good part. Unfortunately, there are stories, real stories, that uh, the same soldiers went to other places and uh, raped uh, women and robbed people, confiscated uh, things. Um, it 
wasn't a pretty situation, but we were free. We were free to leave the ghetto. I remember going, uh, walking back to an, apart to an apart original apartment, dead bodies on the street, dead horses. That time they used lots of horse uh, drawn carriages to deliver whatever they had and the to city deliver. In complete ruins. And the city was in complete yeah. ruins. We were lucky again, I have to use these words, because our building was not bombed, but not only that, our apartment was occupied by a family who, when they saw us coming back, they said, we are glad to see you, we're gonna move out and you can move in. They preserved all of our furniture, all of our belongings. When we had to leave, my mom could take a small suitcase. They still had to uh, hold me on her arm. And uh, we went back and uh, we got everything. Other people weren't lucky uh, because their building were uh, bombed out or the families who occupied their apartment said, no way, we are not gonna move out, it's our apartment. And, um, and that was the end of the story. What, um, and of course, a whole new set of stories happened from there that we can't get into today too much, but what, what did your mother do with, with, to help build a new life with you at that point? She still has a very young son and it's just the two of you. Well, uh, in a nutshell, she worked hard as she has uh, done in all of her life. Um, hats uh, weren't in fashion any longer, so she couldn't uh, make a living out of uh, her original profession. She became a seamstress. She was always very good with her hands. She started to uh, work uh, in a small uh, company or co-op, that time it was a, a co-op, and uh, making um, female dresses. And uh, she worked uh, hard, uh, two shifts, um, six to two or two uh, to 10 in the evening. I was all by myself at home that time. But we survived. Um, we were not persecuted um, anymore as Jews. Uh, circumstances were very harsh. Later, the communist system was as dictatorial as, uh, as the Nazi system in a different way. But um, again, when you are alive um, and you know the difference between being alive and not, you appreciate everything you have. You, um, your mom was, was, from everything that you've shared, she was incredibly brave, resourceful, and resilient. And um, you, you, one of the things you said to me is that um, your, her only purpose was to take care of you after that, her only purpose. And she used her wit and her wits and her strength to do that. Um, and from that point forward, it was the same, same thing. Yes, um, again, uh, the only way I can pay tribute uh, to her is, I cannot tell her anymore, I, I told her many times how much I appreciated and loved her uh, to preserve her memory and telling other people what uh, she did uh, during those um, years and under those circumstances. She worked uh, hard in all of her life. Uh, she remarried in 1953. My stepfather was an other Holocaust survivor. Uh, he actually was in Auschwitz. He actually had the number mm -hmm. tattooed on his arm and it's part of the Holocaust history that uh, no matter how many times I ask him to tell the story, his Holocaust story, he never ever told me. He never ever told me. So I know what happened in Auschwitz. I know that he was uh, approximately 45 pounds when he came back. He was 45 years at that time, old. And he survived. Um, 
actually he came home in his Auschwitz uniform and I still have the jacket, uh, which I, uh, again, will uh, give to the museum for preservation. I'm gonna jump way forward, of course, to 1980, uh, when you were able to make a trip out because you, you had, um, you were a scientist, an engineer, and you were able to travel a little bit under restrictive conditions, but you came here and then defected. Your, your mother was able to make a visit here. Will you tell us about that? Yes, actually, after I settled here, um, practically every year, uh, either she came uh, to visit us or we went uh, back to Hungary after I got my American citizenship and uh, the Hungarian Communist government collapsed in 1989, I believe. And so we were in regular touch. There was no internet, so we couldn't Skype that time. But uh, we offered her to move here after my stepfather died. Um, she didn't want to hear about it. She lived her independent life until age uh, 90. Uh, lived her own old apartment, took care of herself. You still, there's a lot that you don't know about your, the death of your father, um, but you, you honor him every March, I believe. Will you, will you say a little bit about that? Well, my father uh, doesn't have a marked grave. So this museum, actually is a memorial to him and uh, the six million Jews who died and who doesn't have uh, marked uh, graves. And it's a Jewish custom that we lit Yarzat candle, so-called Yarzat candle in the memory of uh, the loved one who is not with us anymore. I do it at my home, and I do it here at the museum, where everybody else can pay tribute. Thank you. Um, we're gonna hear again from Peter in just a moment to close our program. Um, we didn't have time to, to have you ask questions. I apologize for that, but I think you can see that we only touched on a little bit, and, and there is so much more about the post-war years that I wish we could have you hear from Peter about that. Um, when Peter is done, two things are gonna happen when he closes our program. Our photographer Lolita is gonna come up on the stage and take a photograph of Peter with you as the background. So we want you here for that. It makes for just a terrific photo. And then the second thing is Peter's gonna go up to the foyer where he will sign copies of um, Echoes of Memory and there's a chance to say hi to them at that, to Peter at that point as well. It's our tradition at first person that our first person gets the last word. And so with that, I'd like to turn back to Peter to give us his last word. First of all, I wanna thank you that uh, you came here today to hear my story and uh, all the people who come to this museum and uh, see what happened. Uh, to six million people when uh, hatred uh, was not countered, when um, people uh, stood by while others were harassed or uh, arrested and persecuted. There is a picture in the permanent exhibit and um, Every time I see it when I'm a docent and lead a tour or just have the image in front of me, two young boys um, about my age, maybe a little bit uh, older than I was when I was in the Budapest ghetto, standing at the platform of the Auschwitz uh, railway station. Three hours after that picture was taken, they were dead. Because um, for one reason and one reason only uh, because they were Jews. 
I feel I am obligated to their memories and, uh, and the memories of the more than one million Jewish children who died, who never had a chance to grow up and have their own families, uh, their children and grandchildren, to keep their memories alive, and especially nowadays when anti-Semitism alive and well and uh, science all over the world in Europe and unfortunately here in the United States and people are dying against just because of their religion or ethnicity. I feel that we cannot uh, stand by survivors and because um, I am 78 years old and I am the second youngest in the survivor group uh, in the museum. One day, uh, one day soon, I'm afraid uh, we are not going to be here to give our testimony. So it's up to you and uh, your children to make sure that um, Holocaust will never happen again to any people anywhere in the world. And I hope uh, that's the message uh, you're going to take home today.